welcome. This is Zero Limits Living. Every week, I bring you inspiration and information to transform your life. And every week gets better and better. In fact, the show has become so popular, you can now see it or hear it on 1,000 different platforms around the world. Probably anything you can name. To make it easy for you, I'm putting all the episodes in one place online at ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. Also, before we go too far here, I want to remind you that you should check out Miracles Coaching. The best way to transform your life at an accelerated rate is to have an experienced coach. I started Miracles Coaching almost 20 years ago, trademarked it. It's a system that works that has been proven to work. You can have a free consultation and find out all about it. No charge, no obligation. Just go to miraclescoaching.com, miraclescoaching.com. One more thing. I am a creator. I'm always coming out with new books, new products, new online programs. My latest, greatest one is really taking the world by storm. And I would not be doing you a favor if I didn't tell you about it. So please check out mental time travel system.com. It's a way to change the past your perceptions of the past. So you're more empowered in the moment. So you can create a future that you long for fantasize and deserve. Now, all of that said, let's move on to the juicy stuff. I've got a guest here that I've known to love. I've known to respect. He is walking wisdom. He has so much experience. He's been telling it in the form of stories in a private group I was in that he was in with me. And he's written several books. I didn't know he wrote so many books. The latest one is called The Maestro Monologue. And the maestro monologue, and the subtitle says it all, discover your genius, defeat your intruder, design your destiny. Now, the man who's saying this has proven that all of this works. He was a school teacher for 17 years. He left it, went into the real estate business, made hundreds of millions of dollars there, wasn't satisfied, went into the restaurant business, made hundreds of millions of dollars there, and then well, we'll get more of the story here and the, the tidbits as we talk to him. He started telling the rest of us how to live a spiritual, material, successful life. I'm fascinated, and that's why he's my guest today. I'm talking about Rob White. He says he was a small town boy born on the wrong side of the tracks who made millions in the real estate and restaurant industry. Today, he's an author. I think he's written four books. And he's explaining the reality of what it means to be a human being. His newest book is the one I just held up, The Maestro Monologue. And now, Rob, come on board. <laughs> well, thank you, Joe. That was great. You got, you got me so excited. I was wondering who we were going to be on board with. <laughs> right. Well, you know, as your position where you're at, I guess, in your house there, you have about 15 halos around you. Oh. Most people, if they're lucky, get one. But there's oh, like right. three on this side, three on this side. You are, you're some sort of evolutionary wonder. Oh, that's, <laughs> I'm looking up at that now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, con congratulations. I've thoroughly enjoyed reading your book. There is great wisdom in this. You are a guy who's been around the block, learned from your laps around the block, and are now sharing it with others. So thank you for writing the book. Uh, I almost don't know where to begin, so forgive me if I just leap into the deep end in some ways. First question is, do you still have Shakespeare? I do. Shakespeare, you do. my parrot uh, friend now of 38 years. Are yeah. you serious? Yeah. Uh, Shakespeare is still with me. And uh, I did a little research about you, and there was an article that talked about you walking around a park in an area I don't know. I, I don't know Boston. And you have a parrot that sat on your lap or on your shoulder, and you named it Shakespeare. Yeah. 38 years, you are 78 years old. I hope that's okay that I said that. Oh, absolutely. Because you are a wise man. But that means that bird has with, been with you a great deal of your life. Should I be interviewing Shakespeare? Yeah, 40 years. Uh, he's oh, been with you. Uh, oh, what's God. interesting about life, it's a miracle how things show up. And he's a dear close friend, a mentor who's taught me patience. Uh, I was in Miami and, and a homeless person said to me, want to buy a fertile parrot egg? 
and he showed me an egg. And of course, I thought it was a skit. You know, maybe I'll give him money. So I said, okay, here. And I gave him $10. He said, and I walked away. He said, where are you going? I said, what do you mean? He said, you just bought an egg, a, a fertile parrot egg. Uh, don't make a fool of me. I said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, take it home, put it on, make a little napkin nest and put one of those lamps uh, to, and it'll hatch in another week. Well, I took it home. I was about to toss it out. And then I thought, geez, what, what if? So I did make a paper towel and a lamp. And I was reading one night and the egg started moving. I held him in my hand. He bit through the eggshell and, and bit my finger and looked at me. And here we are 38 years later. Uh, you see, life is always ready to, to gift us. Uh, yeah. And I tried to turn that down. See, I, what I'm really aware of, Joe, that's powerful and different, I think, is I get this two of me. Now, when I'm talking about me, I get there's only one of us in the room ever. Uh, we're all the same. Uh, there's the maestro, which is why the maestro monologue. There is a part of me fully capable of orchestrating my life in a magnificent fashion. But then there's the unwanted mental house guest I call the intruder, the, the naysaying voice. And that voice is always with us. You don't get rid of that other self. We live in a world of polarity. We live in a world where I know we wish we could just be the maestro or whatever one would like to call that part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we signed on to a, a realm, a reality of polarity. So we had, when we were born, we were just the maestro. That's why we, we took on walking and talking and reading and writing and riding a bike way up front. Uh, before, while the maestro was really prevalent, we were very conscious of us, ourselves as, without having the words, I am the maestro. What shall I orchestrate next? With the 60,000 no's that come between age two and five, child psychologists say that's what the average child hears, we created a, another identity, a flawed self. We started saying, after even 10,000 no's, there's got to be something wrong with me. I mean, I can't even play with my turtle in the toilet without mom getting mad. Mm -hmm. And so by age five, we created an other self called, I call the intruder. I noticed that the intruder is very clever because once we gave it life, we gave it life, I gave it life unwittingly, naively, innocently, uh, it never leaves me. It is an entity that intends to exist in my presence for the rest of my life, and it does that. It manages to stick around no matter how successful, and I've been around some very successful people. For example, even, uh, I'll give you an example. We know lately Tom Brady uh, got a divorce during his, and he's uh, one of the greatest football heroes ever. And mm -hmm. he got very depressed about it. He had to take a few weeks off. That was the intruder. Even in Tom Brady, as much as the world loves him and all he's done, give that intruder an opportunity to say to Tom Brady, you should be ashamed of yourself. Look at what you've done. You, Every one of us has a voice. I do too very strongly you should be ashamed of yourself mm. well, first of all shame, shame is a is a human construct in, in the universe there's no shame <clears throat> Girls, whales stars there's no shame mm. we create shame so how did you discover this at one point you were a school teacher during for 17 years i found when i did a little research on you i didn't know that did you find it during that period? Was it during the real estate period? Was it during the restaurant period? Was it after all of that? When did you discover this? All right. So now we'll jump to I, after getting out of college and going into service and finishing that, I started teaching. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I always wanted to be a multimillionaire business entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But I went into teaching because the intruder that part of me that told me you're flawed, now don't be a fool, don't make a fool of yourself, uh, get yourself a nice secure job with a good health plan, good retirement plan. Mom and dad agreed with that. Their intruders were right involved in their own lives. And so I did. And I always secretly, teaching is a grand profession, wonderful, but it wasn't, I've never heard of a teacher becoming a multimillionaire. So how did I think that was gonna happen? Play the lottery, what's up with me? Well, a student 
one year, my 16th year, 17th year, 16th year, said to me, uh, Mr. White, I want to go to this private school, but I don't think I can get in. I said, Debbie, why, why do you say you don't think you can get in? She said, well, there's a part of me that tells me I don't deserve it. And she's the one who told me, my God, what is this part of you? I was interested in her, not me, that has you saying you can't, you're intelligent. I get you. I get that you goof. You goof off a lot. You smoke cigarettes. You don't go to study class. You're flippant. But you've got what it takes. What is this? Tell me about this part of you. Well, I get that life was helping. She was a mentor. She was an unassuming guru who had come before me. I helped her to see that. It, what if in, you were to go to study class in a library? Um, what if you were to stop? hanging out front with your friends smoking cigarettes and, and, and came in and got extra tutoring. What if you did that? I mean, just what if? What if you didn't let that part of you you're talking about make your decisions for you? Mm -hmm. Now, when I was saying this, I was discovering something about me while she paid attention to me. Here's the part, Joe, I want you to get. The next year, I'm um, looking through the roster. Oh, I wonder where Debbie is. Oh, she got into that private school. <laughs> I sat there and said, oh my God, I taught Debbie what I have to teach myself. <laughs> I have to get out into life. If I'm going to get into that world called entrepreneur millionaire, I've got to stop hiding behind a very cushy, secure job. So I went into my principal and said, this is my last year. He said, what are you, crazy? Retirement? I'm 17 years. In three more years, you can retire with a limited income. What are you, out of your mind? I went to my father. Here's what my dad said. You don't need a psychiatrist. You need a team of psychiatrists. <laughs> You're crazy. Thanks, so all Dad. The, yeah, well, thanks, Dad. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. But my point to you is, because of Debbie, I did leave. I left. Uh, I left the school at the end of the year. I didn't just drop it and and um, said, "This is it for me." And I was walking on Huntington Avenue in Boston. Now, here's something you don't know, Joe. What am I going to make a million dollars in? I don't know what I'm going to make a million dollars in. What am I doing? Am I crazy? There's the intruder coming back. You know, what? see you know what you did, you idiot? You should be ashamed of yourself. Oh, my God, can I get my job back? Oh, I better run in and see. No, let's just keep going. Let's see what happens. Walking down Huntington Avenue, that's the big avenue in Boston. I look down, there's a book, Joe. Oh, brand new book, face down. Who doesn't pick up a brand new book, face down? Pick it up. How to Get Rich in Real Estate by Robert Kent. Are you serious? This book was laying on the street? Yeah, brand new, never opened. Uh, How to Get Rich in Real Estate by Robert Kent. I mean, a sign, you're talking a sign here? Right, right. I took, I took, the, book, I took the book to my apartment. I was renting back then still. Absorbed it, read it, read it. Did what it told me to do. And now this is going to, this is amazing. And it said, buy a three family and da, 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 and start small and grow. Well, I was to the point about two years into it, well, I was doing very well, making more than teaching. And I decided to buy a larger building, 30 units. Oh, that's a lot. Oh, boy, that's kind of scary. So I did what it said. And I got there. Back then, there wasn't computers. And in, 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 in the Boston Globe, they had real estate by owners, real estate by brokers. And one of his, his things was always buy but from the owner. There's no broker fee. So... I go and I meet this fellow, refined looking, uh, and he, he's the owner. And I said, hi, hi. And I said, so can I see the book? Yeah, sure. So I got my book, see, and I'm checking off. He says, what do you got there? I said, oh, my book. He said, what's that? I said, that's my Bible for getting rich in real estate. He said, let me see it. Oh, by Robert Kent. Yeah. He says, would you like to get his autograph? I said, are you serious? He pulls out a pen. He signs it. He was Robert Kent. Oh. <laughs> he then walked me down to the Brookline Savings Bank uh, because I, I don't think I can get a mortgage. I haven't got enough from It's a big piece of property, very wealthy neighborhood. And he knew them down there. He knew them well. He recommended me. They gave me a mortgage. Yep, Robert Kent, How to Get Rich and Real. That, that's, that's when I got if I trust the maestro, if I really believe the maestro is available 24-7, if I'm willing to um, pay attention to that other me that doesn't scream nay in my head, 
That's the miracle maker. That's the one you love the word miracles. That's the one that's attracting miracles constantly, constantly, constantly. Mm-hmm. So that's how I got on. That's how I began my venture. Yeah. That is, you got chills going up and down my spine, Rob. That is an amazing story, which I've not heard before. You you have, uh, I think, first of all, right now, people are jealous of you. You walk down the street and a book that transforms your life is brand new, face down, on the ground. You don't even have to buy the darn uh-huh. thing. You just have to pick it up. Yeah. Now, here's the important thing, though, because I think we all have guardian angels. Yours are yours manipulate reality a little better than most people's by throwing a book on the street. But here's the thing. Your intruder was still with you. You oh, didn't yeah. have anybody when you picked up that book. In fact, you didn't have anybody when you left the school and you left your job. How did you wrestle with that? We'll call it the devil because Napoleon Hill had that book outwitting the devil. In many ways, he's referring to an intruder. How did you wrestle with the intruder during the time that you didn't have a mentor and right before picking up the book? And thank you. That's a great question. I got the intruder as clever and he can show up at the slightest bump and, and, and have me worrying about things. So what I did is I started talking to him like this. Oh, you're good. I'd say to him, oh, you're good. You're starting to convince me I made a big mistake here, but I got news for you. I'm going to refer to the to the maestro. Uh, I appreciate you interrupting uh, my conversation with the maestro. I get you're trying to help me out, but I'm going to let it go. So I started, t- don't get angry. Here's something I learned. Joe, don't get angry at the intruder or you give it life. If you say, damn it, I did it again, or damn it, or I'm really embarrassed, you are giving life to the, that's his juice. That's Mm -hmm. his juice. Because he'll say, see, I told you so. Now pay attention to me. Be more conservative. Don't take risks. What's wrong with you? Now look at you, you idiot. So I learned the only way I can confront the, because I'm never going to get rid of the intruder. He's an identity that I firmly implanted in my, my consciousness, and it's there till the day I die. But the way I deal with it is be nice to it. And I praise it. Oh, you're clever. Wow, you're good. And and so that's how I'm able to develop a profound relationship with the maestro, which is what we have to do. Now, I'll tell you another one who taught me that. I actually, W. Clement Stone was a student of Napoleon Hill. And he had written a book, and the name of the book I forget, And I bought the book and I went right in Brookline Village, which is about two miles from me. There was, he owned Combined Insurance Company of of America. And once every month, he'd show up at the world headquarters, which happened to be, he moved it from Chicago to uh, Brookline Village. He'd have a paper bag lunch free seminar. And he started talking about which I am is sitting here listening to me because there's two of you, and one of them will pretend you're, it, it's interested in what I have to say, but it's not. And he said, and I'll tell you the one, those of you, I can look and see which of you, which one, he didn't have the word intrude you. He just said the other I am. There's two I ams. The I am you are, and if you're here being that authentic I am, I've got something to help you. If you're being the other I am, pretending to be the authentic I am, you don't even know you're pretending. And he said, I'm going to tell you which ones you are. It's the ones that are already looking at your watch, whispering over here to this one. Uh, And I just want you to know you're wasting your time. And I don't mind if you sit here, but the, I'm going to use my word, the intruder is taking the uh, paperback lunch seminar you want, and it will convince you it's paying attention and it's going to do something with it. Oh, it's clever. But that's the many people I've met, Joe, and I've met many who said, you've made millions. I've read a lot of books, and, and none of them have done anything for me. And I've said to them, Joe, that's because you haven't read the books, not the authentic you, not the maestro, not maestro me you, intruder me you has read them. When you read them, you are always thinking, yeah, but, or yeah, yeah only if. And, and, and when you hear that conversation going on in the back of your mind, no, that's intruder you, it will jump in and cl- it'll read a thousand self-help books. It will do whatever you want to do as long as it convinces you not to grow, not to expand, because that's when you shrink it out of existence. So, yeah, that's a big one, Joe. 
Uh, that's another great story. I didn't know that you had uh, been in a seminar with W. Clement Stone. He, in many ways, saved Napoleon Hill's butt yeah. when Napoleon Hill was struggling after divorces and things like that at one point. So I'm impressed with that. Also impressed with what W. Clement Stone told you about these two selves. The thing that I'm hearing is that you seem to be more familiar with the intruder than with the maestro. And I, I, it could just be based on the, the stories you've told so far. But how did you become more familiar with the part that you ended up trusting? Because I yeah. think everybody listening or watching right now, we want them to be aware of the intruder, but we want them to be aware of the maestro and listen to the maestro. So how did you learn to hear and recognize, oh, this is the one I want to pay attention to, not the intruder? I had to establish a profound relationship with forgetting. So what I got was, I'm real good at forgetting the authentic me, the maestro. So I had to put reminders in place. So back then it went cell phones on my on my uh, mirror. Uh, with I am I I had been saying I had come up with the word maestro a long time before I put it in the book on my mirror in, in the in the bathroom. I am the maestro. So when I got up in the morning, I reminded myself in my wallet back then when I, when I put out my credit card on a card in my wallet, I am the maestro. I had to have a proof, but here's what I want you to get. Until you get that part of being a human being is forgetting. So forgetting is a quality human beings are real good at. And you've got to have a profound relation. Don't get angry when you forget. Oh, damn it, I forgot that. You've just reinforced forgetting. Anytime you're angry and push against something you don't want, you've given more power to that that you don't want. So what I do when I forget is when I find myself, even today, if someone agitates me and I see the intruder showing up and dominating them, I will say to myself, oh, I forgot I'm, I'm the maestro. Now, how would the maestro handle this? And then I will, you know, here's some things too. You, I'm willing to be embarrassed. I will say that to you. So if you and I are talking and I get angry and I say, well, I think that's stupid, Joe. I will say to you, ooh, that's my intruder. Excuse me, Joe. Let me reply from the maestro me. Uh, and then I'll, I'll respond again. You see, what I also got was <clears throat> you shouldn't be ashamed of being embarrassed. See, we're told uh, we're, you, you, shouldn't be, you should be ashamed of yourself. You shouldn't be ashamed of yourself or anything. You should be have a profound relationship with failing and not doing what was accurate, but never be ashamed of yourself. And if you're embarrassed, I remember when I was in Little League and I wasn't a very, uh, I wasn't a very good baseball player and I was swinging out high and then I was up and, and I, you got to get a hit, got to get it on first, we're going to lose. And I, sw I, I swung out. I don't even think the ball got over the plate before I had swung the bat. I was so anxious. And I said to my grandfather, Brian, I'm so embarrassed. And he said to me, you see that squirrel up there? I said, yeah, there was this on the, yeah. That squirrel has done 20 stupid things today. And he's never embarrassed. He's never embarrassed. Why are you embarrassed? Why, why are you embarrassed? And he, and, and he kept saying to me, I don't get this embarrassed. You swung out. What, what is that supposed to mean? What are you ashamed of yourself? Are you ashamed? Where did you get? So my grandfather, who was a wonderful old, who lived to 99, I plan to live to 99, I'm 78, I got 21 years left. Um, he, he was an interesting coot. Uh, and he got that embarrassment and shame. A huge, they come, he said, they come from here. They come from conversation. They don't exist in reality. There's no, there's no, pre, there's no fox out there. There's no lion out there. And they make some pretty stupid mistakes sometimes where, you know, a cat, or a dog, he said, what they do is they take a look at what they did and they figure out what to do to improve it. They don't spend time being embarrassed. Well, the intruder's favorite feelings of being embarrassed, having you feeling ashamed of yourself, feeling guilty. And my grandfather helped me on the road to, oh, now that doesn't mean you should continue to do what you did if it doesn't work in life. But you got to have a, pro no, I'm saying what I say a profound relationship with forgetting who you are so you can constantly remind yourself, oh, I'm the maestro, what am I doing now? Responding like the intruder. And then a profound relationship with failure so you get 
error, it, correcting errors are the only way to get into where I wanted to go. No one has ever just said, I'm going to be a millionaire in real estate, woke up and said, there you go, I'm a millionaire in real estate. Uh, no one has ever said, I'm going to, I'm going to walk. And we've all said, I'm going to walk and just got up and here I am walking, mom, look at me. When we were just the maestro learning to walk, we got intuitively that walking meant we were going to trip and fall over ourselves continually. And we were never embarrassed. We weren't ashamed of ourselves. We just took a look at what we did and said, well, that didn't work. I guess you can't step on one toe while you're trying to lift the other so I'll have to try something else out. No, this is all intuitively. So profound relationship with self, the maestro. Profound relationship with forgetting that you're the maestro. A profound relationship with error, feeling that you might correct your errors. And then a profound relationship with succeeding, which means once I bought a three fam, I got to refine the way I, I work my, my real estate industry and buying another one, work with my tenants, hiring people. I have to refine it. So it isn't success, Bip, here it is. It's success and refining success so that it becomes success with accelerating acceleration. And that's when my millions became tens, became hundreds. Yeah. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. You had a, a guardian angel in the form of a grandfather who helped you. And I'm curious, was there anybody who helped you with the real estate? Was there a mentor? Was there somebody who inspired you? Somebody that you went to for questions? Somebody who groomed you? Somebody who mentored you? We're talking about the inside with the maestro and the intruder. But with a comment like your grandfather helping you, I can't help but wonder, was there one or more people who helped you with the real estate? Yes, I think that there are so many everyday, ordinary, unassuming gurus out there. Eddie Zucker, a dear friend of mine, billionaire uh, in real estate. Uh, back 35 years ago or so, uh, he was very prominent in the town of Boston and Brooklyn, the city of Boston, town of Brooklyn, owned a lot of real estate. He was worth a couple of hundred million back then. And I want, and he was my age. How can that be? So I've got to meet this guy. You're not going to meet him. He doesn't want to meet you. There's the intruder, right? What are you doing? You know, he's at another league. What are you going to pester him? So, yeah, what, what's wrong with you? Like that. There's my intruder. Well, I knew where his office was, so I started uh, stalking him. Like, I just walked by, and oh, and I actually could see the window. Oh, that's his. Oh, there he is. Oh, my God. Because he was <laughs> in the paper all the time. So I decided I'm just going to go in. Because my grandfather would say, go ahead in and just say, I'd like to introduce myself. I'd love to talk with you. And if he says, get out, who do you think you are? Uh, my grandfather said, so you get out and, and don't be embarrassed. So what? You went in and, and he said, get out. And so I said, I'll go in like that. He didn't. He said, wow. Uh, he said, so are you getting in real? I said, I'm, 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 I'm starting and I'm doing pretty good. But I really would like someone to give me some tips or something. And, I, and I'd be willing to do something in return. I'm not even sure what it is. He said, do um, you play racquetball? And I do. See, this is what things. I said, yeah. Are you any good? And I was. I said, yeah. I'll tell you what. You give me racquetball uh, lessons and uh, I'll give you a real estate tutoring. See? Uh, and that's, <laughs> it, it, but what, what makes this work, Joe, is don't be embarrassed. I've met many, many famous and, and, and rich people. I basically approach them and I found every one of them, if you're not, if you're nervous around them, they don't want to be around you because you're making them nervous. If you show up just curious about their qualities and skills and how they've used them and they can see it in your eyes and you ask with a sincerity, geez, I'm just really happy to have met you. I don't even know if there's anything more I can say. I just want to say that. They say, sit down. All right, so what do you do? So, and it's because I'm willing to be embarrassed because embarrassed is it doesn't exist as a, as, as an, in reality. It only exists in human psychology. There you go. Ashamed of myself, guilty, embarrassed, only exist in human psychology. And if you can get a grip on that and know the intruder uses those as leverage to totally control your life. Uh, my dad uh, my dad was a mill worker and died a mill worker and always was angry because he always felt he'd never attained what he wanted in any area of his life. 
I didn't know this stuff back then. I don't think he would have listened to me. But I get now looking at dad and I loved him, although we were distant. Um, the intruder had a full grip over him constantly. He, my father found something wrong with everything. Uh, that's the intruder. Uh, my father didn't know there's a part of him that actually sees something right in everything. Uh, and that's, that's the maestro. Mm. Yeah. This is you know, beautiful. I, I'm curious too, Rob, did you have to make peace with money? I know that you had 17 years of being a school teacher, so you were dreaming about being a millionaire, multimillionaire. But a lot of people that go into business, I have seen, have a subconscious disdain for money because on some level they think it's bad, they think it's evil. Did you wrestle with any of that or were you just like, bring it on? Eddie Zucker, the billionaire friend of mine, and I had a conversation about money and he told me that the money is the root of all good. And I thought, wait a minute. Uh, money is the root of all evil, or love of money is the root of all good. Love of money is the root of all evil. He said, well, I give uh, millions to, and he told me his favorite charities, and if I didn't make millions, I couldn't give those millions. Mm -hmm. And he said, so So his, his, his uh, conversation was something I had never heard before. My family came from he, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil and most people who my father believed if you had a lot of money you either born into it or you're in the mafia I mean that's pretty much it for my father uh, as a matter of fact when I uh, did make a lot of money my father said to me uh, what are you in the mafia and he was half kidding because he, he, and he the, his intruder didn't see any way you're a kid from a small mill town here how did you and why did you quit school? And what's going on? You know, what are you in? Are you selling drugs or something? What's going on here? See, he couldn't comprehend it. My father was so caught, uh, Joe, that you're frozen right now. Is the video okay? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I can see oh, you. you just oh, fine. Okay. Um, my father was so caught that he really couldn't see much good in money. He thought rich people were uh, cheap, evil, uh, ang uh, whatever he thought. I don't know what he thought. I, I'm not him. Mm -hmm. Eddie Zucker was, is one of the most easy. I'm not here to sell Eddie Zucker, uh, you know, but one of the easiest going, loving, kindest people you'd ever meet. And so um, he, again, when it came to money, had me realize, wow. And then the other thing that happened is I went to New Orleans to a New Orleans jazz festival and I met a preacher down there. I forget his name now, big guy. And oh, he was that Reverend Ike? Yeah, Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike, yes. Yeah, and he had all kinds of gold jewelry and everything on, and he was a preacher of Jesus, and a good one. And he used to say, I love money, and money loves me. Well, <laughs> I thought after that, I mean, it's got to be okay. So right. money is okay. Uh, you see, you got to really get that about money. It's not out to get you. It's easy. Here's another thing I get now, Joe. There were trillions of dollars out there. Becoming a millionaire, when there were only millions, becoming a millionaire was difficult. When there were billions, yeah, it was a little difficult. There's trillions out there now. And if you really want to, if you're really up to it, and you have a profound relationship with the maestro, with forgetting you're the maestro so you can remember, with failing so you can refine what you're doing, and with success so that you can continually succeed to accelerating acceleration, whatever you put your mind to, money will come to you. Yeah. Okay, let's make this real for people. There are people that are watching and listening to this right now who are saying in their head, BS. Yeah. This is a lucky man who yeah. has had a great grandfather who learned from the people who he got to talk to, who finds a book brand new in the street and meets the yeah. author of it and gets the autograph. It sounds like you've got a blessed life yeah. and everything's just falling into place here. So for the people who are, they're listening to their intruder and they're going to shut this down unless yeah. we create an opening. How do we create an opening? How can we help the people watching or listening right now? That's a beauty. First of all, you have to trust. You, you, you know, the intruder will not trust anything I'm saying. And if you're not, the first thing I want you to get right now now, if you're thinking, oh, this guy's just lucky, and then he's pretending like we can all do it. You know, he could probably play the lottery and have won that billion dollar. Line. Look at him. 
it isn't really, I didn't, I gave you the, the, the leaps over the high hurdles. There were a lot of things I did that were, that caused me a lot of pain and grief and fear. I caused myself the pain and grief and fear. I did, they were just things I did. One thing that helped me is when I used to, okay. Once when I was about 25, I went to Vegas with a friend, Bob. And I lost $3,000. And I'm going to tell you something. I was so angry and so upset that for the next six months, uh, I mean, I had a knot in my stomach. I wanted to, I don't know what I wanted, something bad to, to, to somebody, something. I didn't know what I wanted. That's before I had money. And that's when I got all by myself. I'm killing myself here over money. Wow. But now, I mean, here I want to be a millionaire. And now here I am hating my life and hating myself and hating that Vegas uh, card shock was what I call him. He wasn't a card shock. Uh, but I had to have a conversation my, with myself about my attitude with money. Yes, it didn't. Things have worked for me, but I really have had a lot of things that haven't worked for me. And I've had to sit down with my hand in my face and say, you know, when Debbie went to... I don't want you to think it was so simple. Debbie came to me for help to get to the private school. She went, and here I am still teaching that I just said, oh, I know now. I got very depressed for mm -hmm. several months. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, what the hell are you even doing? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what are you thinking? You're a school teacher. She, look, at even she's better than you. You can't. What's wrong with that? It was total intruder, intruder, intruder. Don't think everything was simple. It's till I finally felt so depressed and I was drinking heavy on Friday nights, not an alcoholic, but definitely a Friday night alcoholic. Uh, after several months of that, I finally got, well, that's it then. You must have just checked out. Now, I wasn't thinking of checking out, but I did say, well, what the hell's your point? You get up, you teach, you hate teaching now, and you shouldn't hate teaching, but now you hate teaching. You hate yourself. You shouldn't hate yourself, but you do. You hate your parents because they think you should teach. You shouldn't hate your parents. Oh, no, no. I had to go through all that stuff. So I say you have to be willing to test that intruder because if you don't, if you let the intruder endure and you keep saying yes to the intruder, you will go to your death. Scarcity of money, scarcity of love, scarcity of whatever it is you want. You must be willing to endure the pain and not turn it into struggle. You don't have to struggle. That's melodrama. That's human. That's a human concoction. Pain is pain. You got to go through the pain to get the gain. And I know that's so corny. When I lived for six months, sorry, six weeks with a Maasai tribe in Tanzania, there was a young uh, woman, 23, 24, who, who had a child dying. And they had a ritual for her where they did a dance, a fire dance. And the they don't have a chief. They have a high priest in Maasai communities. Gave her his power to speak to God, the sun God. And by four, they started at about 10 at night. And by four in the morning, she shook and writhed and danced with such beautiful magnificence and grace and beauty. And she, she'd got that she thought she'd got to be the, the maestro from her, 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 the priest. What she did get is she finally let go of the intruder that had her so distraught she's losing her small child because the next day she was going to uh, do a ceremony and ask the sun god, son of life, to take the uh, life spirit from her little six-month-old infant so it would suffer no more. And it was dying. Flies were gathering. But what I saw, so for anybody listening here, here's, here's, here's a woman, a young woman with a dying child where nothing's going right. And, and, and her mentor was the priest who came to her and said, I'm going to give you my power. Now, I call it give, give, really allowing her to access her power as the maestro. The next day, Joe, she went to, I watched from behind, given permission. And I had a, a somebody, a translator, because I would never have known any of this going on. I had hired a translator to be there with me. And she made a nest and she waited for the uh, sun to rise. And as the sun rose, she started chanting that she wanted the sun god to take the life spirit from the infant that it would suffer no more. It 
And she kept chanting that. And the sun was rising above the thicket of the bushes early in the morning, five. And as she did it, ironically, a chimp came out with a baby chimp and looked at her nervously holding the baby and ran off. And then a giraffe came out, because this is a weird thing going on in the jungle at this hour. And, what's, and came and looked down at her with his big giraffe neck and lumbered off. And then a hyena showed up with a big purple tongue, and it was hungry, and it's breakfast. And here he's got a plump little baby, and, 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 and he, look at this. That'll be his appetizer. There's his main meal, the mom. And he starts moving toward her and making this weird noise that was so strange. I'm 50 yards behind, freaking out, figuring they don't leap on me. We're all done now. Uh, I'm as scared as scared can be. I don't know where my maestro was, but it wasn't around at that point. Hers was. She ignored him, and she kept chanting to the sun god with her hands, uh, palms up, baby in a little bush nest she made, and her kneeling next to the baby. Sun the one the young way yo. Well, all of a sudden, after as the hyena approached, it got about fifteen yards, and it was like there was an electrical fence. Every time he started to move forward, he jerked back. He started to move, move forward, he jerked back, and she didn't even acknowledge he existed. And then the sun did come up and come over the, and was coming like fingertips along the meadow where the baby was, as it, as it shined on the baby. This is no exaggeration. The baby's little belly went up, the belly went down, and the baby's belly didn't go up again. The sun god granted her her wish and took the, the life spirit from the physical mm. form. And she looked down and she grabbed, she took a baby and she held it to her face and hugged the baby, kissed the baby's forehead, looked up at the sun and, and, and acknowledged the sun, bowed to the sun, thank you, put it back down. Now, I want you to understand in, in Maasai belief system, when the spirit leaves the form, the form is flesh for the other animals because they eat the other animals and how selfish of us not to give our flesh form to them when our mm. spirit is gone. So I do want you to understand that. Her baby wasn't there anymore, just flesh. She then looked over at the, at the, uh, at the hyena and she bowed, thanking the hyena for its patience. And then she turned around, turned her back on the hyena. And the hyena was just shaking like a German shepherd with a stake in front of it but hasn't been told it can happen yet. She walked about 20 yards away and she put her hand in the air and she went, whoop, and the hyena snatched the baby and ran away. But the story I'm trying to get to is that's when I got, my God, we all have it. We all are the maestro. This woman, you think she's primitive? She's, she's a goddess. She orchestrated the in, entire universe. It was like a Disney film. I mean, how could you, how could she do this? Yeah. So that's it. That so is I amazing. Said, <laughs> that's a hypnotic story that is unforgettable. Um, I, I need to know why you got into the restaurant business. You did really well with the real estate, and you may still be doing that. But you moved into restaurant. And you may not know that I've had restaurant clients. And I spoke 15 years ago to one of the restaurant conventions where all the people that own restaurants come in to learn about marketing. And I was telling them how to barnumize their business. And the thing I remember is how little margin of profit there is in most restaurants. Mm -hmm. You went on to create some sort of mega success and make hundreds of millions of dollars in the restaurant business. First, why the restaurant business? Well, back in my 50s, I was a playboy, and I was Boston's most eligible bachelor, and I drove a Ferrari now. I'd arrived, and I'd like to have parties, and I'd have them at fancy restaurants, and they'd cost me tens of thousands of dollars, and I thought, why don't I just own a restaurant? <laughs> that is actually the way I got into the business, but I also realized that I had high-end restaurants, Devon on the Commons, Dover Seagro, Davio's, which is still around. That's a great story. Davio's, my chef, came to me and said, uh, I, I would like to be a partner. And I was ready to sell. I said, I'll tell you what, uh, Steve DiFilippo still owns it. He owns 17 of them now. I said, um, how, about, how about I mentor you, you get, and, and you take over the whole restaurant? Well, he took it even higher than I did. 
But my point to you is I got that if you're going to make a lot of money in the restaurant business, you've got to have people always feeling good about themselves. I don't care. Even if the meal's terrible, if they, if it's a terrible meal and they feel good about themselves, they forgive you. And I had wonderful chefs and everything. And I had high end restaurants, but that's the first thing I made it clear to every, every one of my staff members, especially the, um, the, the wait staff. Well, I had a, 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 I had a waiter, a young, a young man. He was six, six. He made over a half a million dollars a year in tips at my Devon on the Commons. He was handsome. He was every, he was charming. But every time he asked you what you wanted, he'd get down on his knees. So he was eye to eye to you. He didn't stand up here looking down at you. He, he'd look it down on his knees. And when you gave him your credit card to pay, he always looked at the name and said, well, thank you, John. I really enjoyed serving you. My God, they thought he was... He made so much money just being nice to people. So I made a lot of money in the restaurant business serving excellent food and being really nice to all my clients. Yeah. That That's is beautiful. Yeah. That That's is beautiful. Problem. Now, this is the point in my interviews where I get very frustrated because I'm very engaged. I have lots of questions, but we're down to the wire in terms of time. Yeah. So I think what I'm going to do is ask you a couple more rapid fire questions. And there are things like, based on all of your experience, which is phenomenal, this is very rare to have this experience in all these different categories and all the insights that you're sharing and the books that you are writing. What do you want people to, to really know? Definitely, they want to recognize the intruder and the difference with the maestro. But if you went a step beyond that, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to do? What's the biggest takeaways you can give people watching or listening right now? I mean, if I just say it spontaneously and not be clever, and I don't want to be, I want you to know life loves you. I mean, mm -hmm. you know what? Life loves you being alive. And mm -hmm. when, and that's, if you can just get that. And, mm -hmm. and also I want you to get this. You're here to, to, Feel your aliveness, you know, whatever that is. That's when you and life are in a dance together that is so much fun. Uh, I still jump out of airplanes at 78 because I feel so, oh, I, I skydive at 78. I feel so alive. And so, and that's when life applauds me. And that's when I applaud life. So if, you, if you're willing to just get that you are, children got it until we knocked it out of them, obviously. That's when the intruder showed up. You're not here to, you're here to work hard and make it through life. Yeah, that's it. That's simple. I, I love the phrase, feel your aliveness. Yeah. Feel your aliveness. There, there's, that's a book. That's a song. That's a something. That Just remembering the phrase, feel your aliveness. What's next for you? You've got 20 to 30 more years to go here. What what are you most excited about that you're going to be doing next? Um, my first epic was teaching. The second was real estate. The third was restaurants. The fourth is author. And now the fifth is philosopher. I, uh -huh. I love, uh, I'm a philosopher. Investigating deeper into the nature of reality, the nature of humanity. I just, mm -hmm. I just love that. That's it. I love, love, love it. I meet people who are philosophers in colleges and talk with them about Heidegger and other incredible philosophers. And it's funny, but what turns me on from back in my fifties, it was, it was uh, Ferraris and uh, looking good and, and, and uh, being famous and uh, even being a womanizer. Uh, now I just love getting up and really just studying life in general, just taking a look. I was watching a squirrel today scoot up and down the tree with its little acorns. I spent 10 minutes just watching the squirrel. I was in delight. I mean, it was so efficient and effective with what it was doing. Right. That, yeah, so that's it. Yeah. Well, I wonder what the philosophy of a squirrel is, you know, just get yeah. the nuts. <laughs> I, uh, I lived in a country estate for a long time, and there was a squirrel that was very overweight. And he would not go after nuts. He actually came up to me when I'd be on the porch having a cigar. And he looked at me like, I ain't going to get the nuts. Why don't you give me an apple? And I started giving him an apple, which made him more overweight. And I'd see him just lay flat, 
with his That's arms funny. out. It's like, I'm not going to store it. I'm not going to do anything with it. And I'm not going to hunt. It was the philosophy of that squirrel, which kind of implies the squirrel has free will. Do you yeah. think we have free will? I do. I think your I am is your will to power. Uh, you must start with I am. Present tense, right? Uh, present tense, uh, personal noun. I am is how we are powerful. It's the will to power our lives to be the way we want them to be. And it starts with, and I mean this, and I don't want to sound like a school teacher. I am the maestro. My God, don't let that go. That is it, man. And from there, what do you intend to do with it? So I'm a millionaire was a feeling I had before I was a millionaire. I am a very successful, uh, popular entrepreneur in the restaurant industry was the feeling I had before I was. I am, I am an author. It's a feeling I had before, and I've had a couple of books that have done pretty darn good, and I'm a philosopher. So the I am shows up before the physical experience, and there's your power to will, and I think we all have that power. I don't think I know. Yeah. That is beautiful. Rob, I have one more question for you, and I am very grateful to know you, very, very grateful that you've made the time for me here and for everybody watching and listening. Was there a question that you wanted me to ask when you knew that we were going to talk and there's been some weeks before we got here uh, in your mind where you're thinking, oh, I hope Joe asked me this question. Or was there a story that you really wanted to tell and you didn't get a chance to? So here is your opportunity. What do you want to say? You actually do a wonderful job and asked everything I could imagine. I wanted to be spontaneous. And the story I think that I want, uh, that I was most wanting to share with you folks was the one about the book on Huntington Avenue. Yeah. It is that I'm lucky. It's that I actually have an I am that knew I was up to making millions in real estate. We had to get started. And I didn't know why, what it was in, and I didn't know how to get started. So that's that turning myself over. Some say over to God. Some say over to, I don't care, your guardian angel. I say over to myself, over to my authentic self. Mm -hmm. And that's the story that's most important. Every one of us, it's mm -hmm. there waiting. That moment is right there if you're willing to trust that I am that you are, you've always been, that you forgot you were because you got so involved in being the I am you're not, that you're pretending you are. <laughs> that is beautiful, Rob. I'm going to go buy several copies of your book and I'm going to go lay them in the street where people walk <laughs> by face down and I want to see who picks them up oh, yep, because yep. they need to pick them up and read it and use it. But anyway, your book is on Amazon is probably wherever books are sold. Is that right? Correct. The Maestro yeah. Monologue? Yes. All yes. right. And your website, is it robwhitemedia.com no. or is there another one? Oh, that's it. Perfect. All right. Rob. Thank you. You have influenced lots of people. You are influencing me, and I look forward to more sharings and collaborations with you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. This is Dr. Joe Vitale. You've been listening to or watching Zero Limits Living. Every week, I bring you inspiration and information to change your life. And this one, please take note, listen to it, rewatch it, and be aware of your intruder and listen to your maestro and go get Rob's book, The Maestro Monologue. Remember, I'm putting all of these episodes in one place, ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. Remember, go claim your Miracles Coaching consultation. Go to MiraclesCoaching.com. And I thank all of you for spending your time here. You are the light workers of the world. Expect miracles. Thanks. Glutathione is a big word. It's the body's own master antioxidant. It's a scavenger for free radical, bacteria, and viruses. There are no products in the market with the ingredient NASET. NASET increases the production of glutathione that's in our body already to strengthen and enhance our immune system, elevate sense of well-being, support muscle strength and endurance, cognitive function, and liver support. It helps with increased energy and blood sugar regulation. Get your bottle of GSH Plus from www.salvationnutra.com.